What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the economy. Now, I'm no economist, I don't have a degree in this. I'm just some guy who really likes data. And I've been obsessed with the housing market, the economy, interest rates, inflation, all these things for the past several years. And although you may be hearing things like this. Inflation has definitely done better than any of us thought. Uh, the economy has remained stronger, in the, even in the context of a, ver uh, of a low unemployment rate and inflation coming down. Can't wait. Right now, is a the best time to buy a house in the next five years. Some of you are saying, "Well, I'm going to wait for prices to come down." You're 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 not going to get them. Yeah. They're not coming down. Yeah. Okay. They're going to go up slower, but they're not going to go down. I'm here to tell you that the data that I've been looking at points to the exact opposite. And genuinely, I consider not making this video because most of my channel is just about teaching people how to analyze data. But the more I take a look at all the data out there, the more concerned I'm getting. And so I felt like I should show you the data, show you what I'm looking at so you can make your own conclusions. The first thing that we're going to take a look at is this federal funds effective rate. Now, this is the interest rate at which banks loan money to each other. And if banks want to actually make money, and believe it or not, that's what banks are there for. They're there to make money. If banks want to make money, they have to loan you money at a higher percent interest rate than the federal funds effective rate. And so when that rate is high, they have to loan at a higher percentage in order to actually make money off of that loan. Now, as you can see here in this diagram, this is the federal funds effective rate back to 1955, which is a really long time. Let's just go back to, let's say, the beginning of the century of 2000. We have these really high interest rates and then they drop dramatically after some type of significant incident. Whether it's a war or a housing financial collapse or some type of pandemic, you'll see these interest rates go down during those times. This is because when bad things happen, the government wants people to have access to money. They wanna stimulate the economy. They wanna get people spending again because something bad just happened. And so as you can see right here, when the economy collapsed, interest rates were incredibly low. We're talking one or sometimes even close to 0% interest rates because they just wanna give out money to stimulate the economy. And so during this recession right here after the great financial collapse, you can see they were very, very low. They were slowly going up, got up to about two, two and a half percent. And then we had the pandemic, which again, we saw incredibly low interest rates. Over time though, they started increasing and increasing and increasing. And now we're sitting at 5.33, which is about as high as it's been since right before the great financial collapse back in 2008. Now, why is this so important? Why are we looking at this before all the other things that we're gonna be looking at? One, housing is incredibly important in the US economy. It's something that most people have all of their net worth stored in. So as their home becomes more expensive, they are worth more. But almost as important as that, this also impacts business loans. And that's what the entire US economy is built off of. It's built off of small and medium-sized companies. And most of those companies take out loans in order to pay their employees. Now, when interest rates are really low, it's very easy to start, maintain, and build a company because you can get a million dollar loan and you only have to pay back 1.1 million, 1.2 million. And that means your costs are very low. You can hire on a bunch of people, you can buy all this software, all this hardware in order to start your business. But the thing about business loans compared to something like a residential loan, which is maybe a 30 or a 15 year fixed interest rate, businesses often have a one to seven year period before they have to renew that loan. And so what's happening right now is a lot of those business loans are coming due. And a lot of those people took their business loans during this time, right during the pandemic. They were like, hey, I got laid off of my job or this is the perfect time to start my business right here when the pandemic started. And so a lot of people took out these loans. Well, what's happened since that? A lot of people have had successful businesses. That's what the economy is built off of. But as you can see, that was four years ago. And so as this goes up, People are having to start renewing their loans. If they wanna keep that business afloat, they're gonna to have to take out another loan and it's gonna cost them double, if not triple, to service that loan. But not only that, it's gonna impact real estate a lot. So let's come over here and take a look at mortgage rates for residential real estate. Since 1995, interest rates have slowly been going down from about eight, nine percent, they've slowly started coming down. And we're looking at even two or three percent interest rates for many, many years since almost 2010 all the way to 2022. That's what the Fed actually votes on in order to increase or decrease the interest rates. As those increase, you're also seeing a really high rise in interest rates for residential properties. Now, this piece really has been concerned for the overall economy, not just the individual person, but just the economy as a whole. Now, what's happening right now in the residential real estate market 
is absolutely crazy. Inflation has driven home prices higher than they have ever been in recorded history. And on top of that, the interest rates are going up. And so back in, let's say 2000, interest rates were 9%. Well, the average home during that time was like 175,000 or 200,000. Whereas right now we're sitting in 2024 where the average median home price is about 425,000. That's over double the cost of the median home price about 25 years ago. And I know this is shocking to a lot of you, but the median salary or the average salary as well has just not kept up with inflation at all. And so what we're seeing right now in the residential real estate market is just the perfect storm. Nobody wants to move because they have these lower interest rates on a much cheaper house. They have almost all their money tied into that house. So if they want to move, they're going to have to buy a new house at a much higher price. They're going to be able to put a lot down, but the money that they don't have to put down, they're going to have to get a seven or an 8% interest rate on that loan. And that's going to be a significant amount of money. That is not cheap. If you were to buy a $500,000 home today, and that's with today's current interest rates of 6.99, and they're just the perfect borrower. Most people are not. So they're getting a 7.5, 7.75% interest rate. They're looking at $4,000 to $4,500 per month just to buy a $500,000 home. If you took that same home and let's say you bought it just a few years ago, back in 2021, and you're looking at a 2.7, let's say a 3.25% interest rate, which is a little under half, you're looking at under $2,000. I'm talking $1,900 to $2,000 for the exact same home. And so that piece is a giant red flag in my opinion. That is just sending huge huge red blinking signal saying something is not right. Now we're gonna come back to housing at the end because a lot of the other things that we're gonna talk about directly impact housing and just the overall economy. So let's come over to our next point, which is credit card debt. Now credit card debt just as a whole has been rising a lot. If you look back to 1999, let's say the turn of the century, you're looking at under 500 billion worth of debt. But as we go further, people are taking on more and more and more debt. And then we had the great financial collapse, the great financial crisis back in 08. And people were like, okay, wait a second. We need to start paying off some of this debt. We want to be in a better financial position. But then things started to change. The economy started to get better, started to heal, and people started taking on more debt. And then we had the pandemic. During the pandemic, we were given stimulus checks. People weren't traveling as much because they couldn't. People couldn't hang out with friends. They couldn't go out and dine. And so people were like, hey, I have all this money the government's giving me. Let me pay off debt. That's a wonderful thing, right? But then we started to reacclimate to society and people just went haywire. They were like, man, I haven't gotten to travel in the last two years. I'm going to Bali. I'm going to France. I'm buying this. I'm buying that. I'm buying a new car. And the debt just continued to climb. And now we're over $1.1 trillion in consumer debt through credit cards. That is absolutely shocking. That is the highest it's ever been in history. And this is a very bad sign. It's a very good thing for the economy because people are buying consumer goods. They're going out, they're buying cars, they're buying electronics, they're buying all of these things. But because of that, they're taking on more debt and more money that they do not have. I personally believe that some of this is also just psychological from a lot of people who owned houses. Because as their property value increased, they went from 200,000 to 400,000. They're like, I have $200,000 worth of net worth, I can afford to go on this trip that only costs $10,000. I can afford to buy this $30,000, $40,000 vehicle. Even though they didn't have the actual money, they knew that they were actually worth that much because Zillow says their home is worth this much. And so people were like, I have the money, I can spend it. If I need the money, I can take out a home equity line of credit. I could sell my house, I am set. And so people just kept spending. And so I think as we were coming out of the pandemic and people were being released back into society and home prices continued to skyrocket, there was this huge psychological factor that just caused people to spend a a ton of money. Again, we're going to be coming back to this at the end when I kind of tie everything together. I'm going to give you my overall thoughts and then I'm going to kind of give you some predictions that I have for one, three, and five years out. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is layoffs. Now, this data specifically is for tech layoffs from about the COVID timeframe 2020 to 2024. Um, and the reason we're looking at this is because if we come over here, this is just for almost all jobs across the country. It's remained fairly steady over a lot of years until we had the pandemic and we had a really high increase of layoffs. Uh, and I'll have that one down below, but I just wanted to show you that really quick. But let's just look at tech specifically because tech I think is really interesting in how it does things and how it reacts to the economy. 
As you can see right here, we had a really significant amount of layoffs back in the 2022 timeframe. And we can even see it better, I think, down here. Back in 2022, we started seeing massive, massive layoffs. I'm talking the tune of 167,000 people in one month, just in the tech sector. Now, what was happening is back in 2020, when the pandemic hit, a lot of companies wanted to retain their most valuable asset, and that was the people. And so the unemployment for tech people was just absolutely astonishingly low. Almost nobody was laying people off. A bunch of companies were hiring on at top dollar. But as we started to reacclimate to society, everybody started to go out again. They wanted people to come back into the office. They had massive layoffs. And you can see that started back in about uh, quarter two of 2022, so the end of 2022, and that just continued into 2023, and we're even seeing that today. And these are no small numbers. I mean, on the chart, it looks fairly small, but this is 57,000 people at the beginning of 2024, and we're seeing 39,000 in quarter two of 2024 as well. So these are not great numbers that we're seeing in terms of layoffs, especially just in the tech world. Now, with that being said, you may say, well, layoffs are steadying, and even at that previous visualization that we looked at, uh, layoffs seemed pretty flat. And you're not wrong. In fact, there was about 257,000 jobs net positive that were created this month in June when I'm recording this in 2024, and you can go look up that data. But there is some worrying data, and this may be the most troubling one that I've seen so far. And my predictions going forward for especially this table are not good. So let's take a look at what this is. This is full-time versus part-time employment over the age of 16, 35 hours for purple versus 35 hours for the green. And so in a fairly good economy, you want people to have a lot of full-time jobs. You want people to have uh, healthcare. You want people to have a 401k. You want people to have bonuses at the end of the year. And that is the sign of a very good economy. But what happens when things go bad? Let's look at this right here in the great financial collapse. You can see a lot of people lost their full-time jobs and what happened? They started picking up part-time and gig work. They really were just trying to get any job that they could to pay their mortgage, to feed their kids, and to be able to survive. And that was a really tough time, uh, and that lasted for many, many, many years. That was a really tough time. In about 2016, you can see we had this crossover where now we had a lot less people having to pick up these side jobs, and a lot more people were getting full-time jobs, especially after the pandemic. And that's a great thing, right? But let's see what's happening in the past year or two. Since about 2022, we've seen that number steadily go down for full-time jobs, and we've seen the number for part-time jobs steadily go up. And if this is reminiscent of anything in this chart, you can notice it right back here. That's exactly what happened when the economy started tanking. And so all these part-time workers, they're relying on other people to get this part-time work, and they don't have a full-time job that they can really rely on. And so because of this, people are having to take on more debt, as we saw before. Not only this, people are having to pick up multiple jobs. I know a lot of people who have a full-time job and they have a side job where they work eight or nine hours at their full-time job. And then after that, they go on for a shift at a smaller job where they're working maybe 30 hours per week. And that's a lot of work that people are doing just to survive in this economy. So this one, if you can just kind of project out another year or two, if these numbers continue to go in the way that they're projecting, it's not really a good sign. Now, let's go to the last one. And this one is going to be with groceries. Now this is the consumer price index. This is just the cost of things in the world. And you don't need to know this actual number, but what we will look at is just how much it's actually rising in percentages. If we come over here to let's say 2000, we're looking at a score about 175. In 2024, it's about 325. Let's even just go back to 2020. It's about 260, you know, 275 raised up to 325, that's a very significant percent increase. And let's take a look at some of these numbers. It says over the four year period to March, 2024, so from 2020 to 2024, the price for eating at home rose almost 25%, while eating out rose almost 26%. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. The actual supply chain was a big one. Actually, getting the goods to the destination was very expensive. So that caused things to go up. But not only that, labor costs went up, interest rates went up for businesses, and so they had to increase their prices in order to maintain a positive net revenue. And so that is a really bad sign. But if we come down here, these are all things that I eat. We have meat, poultry, fish, eggs, all went up by about 26 to 28%. 
Things like candy, non-alcoholic beverages, coffee, vegetables, dairy products, and alcoholic beverages all went up from about 13% all the way up to 27%. And these are things that most people eat and drink and use every single day. So that's the data that I've been looking at. And that's not all the data. In fact, I've looked at a ton of other things as well. And if you guys actually like this video and are curious about it, I could dive into like an hour long video looking into all those different data points and connect a lot of different dots. But I think these are the big meat and potatoes of why the economy I think is really struggling. Honestly, I don't think any of that is incredibly surprising. If you've been keeping up with that even a little bit, you've seen interest rates are going up. Food prices are going up. Credit card debt is going up. All these different things. But what does that actually mean for the economy? Because as you saw at the beginning, people are saying the economy is great and the economy is doing really well and we're increasing jobs and people are still spending money. But when does that stop? It stops when people are not able to afford their basic necessities, food, water, electricity, and housing. These are things that people need in order to survive. And so going back to housing, right now we have an incredibly low supply of housing. And that's something that if I was to make another video, I'd go into supply and demand, interest rates, foreclosures, pre-foreclosures, and all these different things. Cause that's in an, I can make a whole video just on that. The housing market has really stagnated because nobody can afford to move and nobody really wants to move. So it's really, really, really slowed down. But my prediction, medium term, talking about the next three to five years, is that people are not gonna be able to afford their homes anymore. And that is very, very scary. And in fact, I think it's gonna be worse than the 2008 financial collapse. Now that is a big thing to say. That's not something I say lightly, but here are some of the reasons why I think that, and we're gonna take longer to actually recover from it than we did back in 2008. In 2008, people were taking out bad loans. And so when the housing market collapsed, people lost their jobs, they lost their houses, and they had to really reset, but, things were relatively affordable. The cost of moving somewhere else to start a new life was affordable. The cost to rent something or rent an apartment was affordable. The cost of food was relatively affordable. But what's gonna happen if people start losing their houses to foreclosures or needing to sell for a different job or needing to sell because they can't pay off their debts? Well, if they have to go and they have to get an apartment, apartments have increased about 75 to 200% in some areas. So they're not gonna be able to afford rent. And then food has increased 25% since 2000. And so even food has become increasingly tough to actually afford. And so in 2008, when people lost their homes, they lost their jobs, well, they still had a way to get out of it. They still could survive, but it's not gonna be as easy when it happens in 2026, 2027. So residential housing is becoming a lot more expensive. It's becoming a lot more expensive to actually run a business because of higher interest rates. Credit card debt is stacking up and people genuinely are having trouble paying it. I didn't show a lot of that data, but people are starting to default on a lot of their loans, whether it's student loan, medical debt, credit card debt, people are starting to default on that. And there's a lot of other data that we could go into that as well. But people are having trouble paying off their debt. And what happens when people can't pay off their debt, specifically credit card debt? Well, the banks aren't gonna give them any more credit. And so they can't then go and buy more things. And so then they have to repay that loan that they took out. And that's what a credit card is. You're taking out a loan, a very high percent interest rate. You can't pay it. You don't have any more money. And that is gonna compound on itself, driving you deeper into debt. When you can't pay your car note, you can't pay your mortgage, you can't pay your rent. That's when things start getting really scary. And I'm not a doomsdayer by any means. In fact, for the most part, I'm very much an optimist. But when I'm looking at all this data, that optimism kind of takes a backseat to reality. And the reality is, is that this economy is not looking good. And so here are my predictions for one, three, and five years out. I think by this time next year, summer of next year, we're gonna have a new president in the US. We're gonna start seeing some massive red flags, bigger than the ones that we're seeing right now. Because what's happening is everything's going up, but we're not seeing the crash yet. We're not seeing the huge cracks that are actually forming, but there are cracks. And so we're gonna start seeing foreclosures on the rise. We're gonna start seeing a lot of small and medium-sized businesses lay people off because they can no longer afford to be in business because of labor costs and good costs. And I think we're gonna see that within one year. Well, let's look out into three years. This is when a lot of foreclosures have started happening. What happens when a lot of foreclosures and a lot of people selling their home all at once start to occur over a short period of time? the housing market drops. So you have to sell your $750,000 house, but you bought it at the peak and now it's only worth 650. And then next month it's only worth 625. And the next month it's only worth 600. It just continues to go down and down and down. You can hold on to it and hopefully you can afford it, but a lot of people aren't gonna be able to afford it anymore. They have to sell. So we're gonna see people's entire net worth, all the money that they have stored in their home, all of that money is just gonna be gone. Not for everybody, but for a lot of people. 
And then five years out, I think we're just gonna be recovering. I think it's gonna be a really tough time. And in fact, I think it's gonna be a really long extended recession. So what does that mean for people like you and I? Just people trying to own a home and survive and have a job and all these things. The biggest things that I would do right now is just save money and don't buy anything big right now. So don't go and buy a house. The car market is doing just as bad as the real estate market. And that's a whole nother thing, but don't go out and buy a new car right now. Don't go out and buy a new house right now. Don't go on massive vacations and don't deplete all of your savings. In fact, I would try to build up your savings as much as I could. I'm not a doomsday prepper. I said it before and I'm gonna say it again, I'm not. But I'm getting genuinely concerned because I think we're just building up and building up and building up and we can't sustain that forever. Eventually there's gonna have to be cracks that are gonna form and there's gonna be a pop and there's eventually I think a very large recession coming. And I'm making this because I want you to prepare. I don't want you to think that the economy is perfect and that everything's good and dandy and you're gonna be able to go and spend as much as you can on your credit card and just be fine. I think there are gonna be some really big repercussions for all of the spending and the inflation that's been happening in the past several years. And I think it's not gonna end well. So I am really sorry to leave this video on a bad note. Again, if you guys want me, if this you know video is you know interesting to you and you really want me to dive into that more and make a much longer video, I can do that and just leave that in the comments below. I would love to hear your feedback as well. If you agree, if you don't agree, I tried to find a lot of different data points that I thought were really indicative. Again, there's hundreds of different data points that you can look at, but this is the data that I think is really, really important to keep your eye on and really important to kind of educate yourself on this so that you can prepare for if things do go bad. And saving money isn't a bad thing. So let's say I'm horribly wrong and the economy just does amazing over the next five years, you save some extra money and you're welcome. And so I hope that's the case. I hope, I genuinely hope that it is not gonna be as bad as I think it's going to be. But from all the things that I'm seeing and all the anecdotal stories that I'm hearing from different businesses and from different people I know, things are not looking good. And so prepare yourself, be really wise with your money and with your job, really try to make yourself invaluable there. So if there are layoffs, you don't get laid off. And hopefully by this time next year, I'm completely wrong and everyone's just super happy. Uh, but we'll see how that goes. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe below and I will see you in the next video.